Thank you. Today I'm going to be talking about how climate change affects our health. And I'm going to talk about a cure that I think is not so hard. When you think about global warming or climate change, what's your first image? This is what most of us think about when we think about global warming. We see this typical uh, stranded polar bear. But that species, we don't see the imminent danger to that species as close to us. It has not moved us to action. So I want to show you that, in fact, it's not your imagination, nor the polar bears, that the northern hemisphere is warming up. And as you look at temperatures over the last 65 years, pay particular attention to the extreme hot days that are hazardous. So 1951 to 1980, 83 to 93, 94 to 2004, 2005 to 2015. It is really getting hotter. We looked at projected future climate for the eastern United States, and we found that by mid-century, almost all cities will have a tripling in the number of extremely hot days, hotter than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's not just warming over land surfaces. The oceans are warming up, and you can see that there's a strong relationship between the green line of sea surface temperature warming and the blue line, which is the power dissipation index or the strength of hurricane winds. And indeed, we are seeing more category four and category five hurricanes around the world. But climate change is not just about rising temperatures. It's sea level rise, it's extremes of the hydrologic cycle, the water cycle, so we're going to see more severe droughts, floods, and fires. And these physical attributes of climate change will affect our health through many pathways, and each one of these pathways has associated health outcomes, lots of climate-sensitive diseases. And starting from the top, heat waves. People die in heat waves, especially in the urban environment air pollution and allergens from, that are climate sensitive, infectious diseases, especially insect-borne or vector-borne diseases, and waterborne diseases. And of course, we all know that our health depends on adequate water and food resources. I want to pause for just a second on the bottom one, environmental refugees. I think this could be the iceberg under the tip of the iceberg. Think about Syria, the civil war in Syria, where hundreds of thousands of people have died. Millions have fled as refugees. I think this could be a huge problem. And this is the future, it's actually the present and the future scene that's going to be uh, exacerbated by climate change. More refugee camps, malnutrition, diarrheal disease, asthma. These are the faces of climate change, not just the polar bear. Because climate change absolutely is a public health crisis. Let me give you an example. Future summers, looking at record-breaking summer temperatures in the future, the top map is mid-century, the bottom map is the end of the century. Everything in red has a 90% probability or greater of having the hottest summer temperatures in their history. Now, if you're growing crops, I don't know if any of you are farmers, you know that there's a, a, a certain envelope, a climatic envelope, and if it gets too hot, the crops don't do well. If it gets too cold, the same thing. And these record-breaking temperatures are predicted to cause havoc with our world uh, food supply. And today's 900 million people currently at risk for hunger could double by mid-century. That's a public health disaster. Ah, but some plants will benefit. Poison ivy and ragweed, actually, do quite well with higher temperatures and more CO2. And since the 1950s, CO2 levels have increased by 27%. And places like Wisconsin have warmed more than one degree Fahrenheit. Look what that's done to the ragweed pollen season. Actually, ragweed plants produce more pollen under these conditions, but also 
the season where there are allergies, anyone with asthma or allergies to ragweed, this is a problem. And you can see that in these higher latitudes around Wisconsin and into Canada, the ragweed pollen season has increased by about three weeks in time. That's a problem. Insect-borne diseases are especially sensitive to weather conditions. I'm gonna ask you a question. What's the difference between us mammals and that mosquito on the screen? Besides the fact that we can't fly, and the event organizers have assured me that most of you don't suck blood. <laughs> well, mammals, we are warm-blooded. Our body temperature is about the same, more or less, all the time. An insect is cold-blooded. So whatever the air temperature is around that mosquito, that's the body temperature of the mosquito. And this particular species of mosquito, Aedes aegypti, carries yellow fever, dengue fever, and Zika virus. And as temperatures warm up, the viral replication rate goes faster in the mosquito, and transmission dynamics increase as well. And there are lots of examples of extreme climate conditions leading to major outbreaks of disease. Now a reminder, it's not global warming, it's not just about temperature, it's also extremes of the water cycle. And in the future, according to the US uh, climate, uh, Global Change Research Program, this is what rainfall will look like. You can see that at the far end there, the heavy rainfall events, those are the ones that are gonna be increasing. So when it rains, it will really pour because hot air holds more moisture so it can get really into heavy rainfalls. Well, we already today have trouble handling heavy rain and storm runoff. We get contamination events where sewage bypasses sewage treatment and flows straight into our rivers and lakes. We call these um, combined sewage overflow events. Sewage and stormwater overflow into surface water. We studied this for future projections for the region. We looked at the Chicago area and found that by mid-century, there could be a doubling in the number of these combined sewage overflow events because of climate change. If any of you go to Milwaukee and sample the water off the beaches after a heavy rainstorm, this is, uh, this is data looking at E. coli bacteria. And look at South Shore Beach, flaming blue hot high levels of E. coli bacteria. And Bradford Beach, red hot high counts of E. coli. Very hazardous for swimming, so this again, contamination, very concerning if we're gonna have extremes of the water cycle, what it means for our water safety. I wanna shift gears and talk about another framing of the problem. This is a, a study we did 10 years ago, and these are not cartoons, these are data-driven cartogram maps. And on the bottom, what we're seeing is locations with climate-sensitive diseases, malaria, malnutrition, and diarrheal disease in particular. And you can see Sub-Saharan Africa, India, poor countries where you have most of these diseases. With climate change, these are gonna be getting worse, and it's a problem. But what is the top map? The top map is a 50-year aggregate of CO2 emissions, the countries that are actually causing climate change. And look what happens to the United States as the number one most responsible country for today's climate change. And look at Africa. Africa shrivels up, not at all really contributing to the problem. And when we published this study, our main headline was that those most vulnerable to climate change are the least responsible. And especially uh, if you're an American, you should feel a bit guilty because per capita, we emit six times more CO2 from our energy habits compared to the global average. So we pin this as maybe the world's greatest ethical dilemmas. And we caught a lot of attention 
and I was lucky enough after this to have the good fortune to be able to discuss ethics, health, and climate change to His Holiness the Dalai Lama about six years ago. The Dalai Lama is a very, very bright man. And he heard this presentation and he looked at me and he said this. He said, Jonathan, if you know pollution kills, your country is not showing much compassion, correct? You know, I started to answer his question by saying, Your Holiness, it's complicated. And I held back and I said, you know, let me get back to you about this. So I thought about his question and thinking about our fossil fuel dependence and that it's complicated and it's going to be really tough to get off of fossil fuels. And then I realized it actually might not be very difficult. It might be quite simple, especially when you think about the actions that we do to mitigate climate change could have enormous opportunities for public health. Let's just take a look at the energy sector. Air pollution kills about seven million people every year. That's one in eight deaths are from air pollution. Putting that in perspective, that's twice the number that dies from AIDS, TB, and malaria combined. According to the World Bank, air pollution costs the world economy over five trillion dollars every year. So opportunity here if we can get to clean energy. Another sector, transportation. Because of over-dependence on motorized vehicles, we have sedentary lifestyles and physical inactivity is estimated to kill more than five million people every year. So when we think about the investment cost of cleaner energy, there's some estimates that it might cost $30 to not emit one ton of CO2. But when we burn oil, coal, gas that causes CO2 emissions and greenhouse gas emissions, we also are emitting dangerous particulate matter and sulfur dioxide and all the other known hazardous pollutants that harm health. So that for every ton of CO2 that you don't emit, you also don't emit those dangerous pollutants so that the health benefit for every ton of CO2 that you avoid emitting is $200. Now I want all of you to take a deep breath because I'm going to ask you an extremely difficult question. You ready? Which number is bigger? <laughs> and a lot of times the policymakers, they're so focused on the upstream investment. Do we want to pay $30 more? Actually, it's probably cheaper because of the dropping price of solar. But do we want to pay more for clean energy? And they're only thinking of that side of the equation when the other side, the health benefit, is far bigger. In fact, the US EPA has looked back at investment, the cost and benefit of the Clean Air Act, and they found that for every $1 invested, it yields $30 in benefits. And if you live in places like China or India where there's very high pollution, there's even greater benefit. But you've heard that if we get away from fossil fuels, we're going to be losing jobs, and that's a problem. Well, is it really? This is the U.S. Energy and Employment Report that came out just uh, in January of this year, and they estimate one million American jobs in renewable energy. That's five times more employment compared to jobs in coal, oil, and gas for power combined. So it just is not true about the job loss. There are more jobs in renewable energy. And because I'm a health scientist, that's meaningful to me because jobs and income translates to better health. So I want to shift gears and talk about opportunities in the transportation sector as I say goodbye to my doggie on my way to work. 
Because of our over-reliance on the automobile, U.S. transportation is contributing to sedentary lifestyles. 60% of Americans do not meet the minimum recommended levels of exercise. Last year, obesity rates reached 40% in adults, 18% in children, and 600,000 Americans die of heart disease every year. But here's the thing, 40% of trips done by car are less than two miles or three kilometers, easily bikeable or even walkable. So a golden opportunity, right? In fact, US cities with the highest rates of walking or cycling to work have obesity rates 20% lower and diabetes rates 23% lower than cities that have the lowest amount of bikeability and walkability. And exercise also reduces the risk of heart disease, cancer, dementia, and depression. So we actually did a study for the upper Midwest region, and we asked this, uh, the question, what if those short car trips, those two-mile car trips, just in cities, in the 11 largest cities of our region, what if we took those off the road? What would the air quality benefit be? And what if just in the summertime, four months of the year, we turned half of those car trips into bicycle trips? What would the added physical fitness benefit be? Well, the headlines from our study were that swapping tailpipes for pedals, small changes could pay huge dividends for public health and the economy. We found that by doing this, you would save 1,300 lives every year. You'd save $8 billion in avoided mortality, absenteeism, and hospitalization. Big savings. So I'm in the health field, and of course I'm thinking prevention. And one of our greatest problems that we've had to solve is tobacco use, cigarettes. Well, look what happened with youth smoking. Youth smoking dropped dramatically when cigarette prices rose. And from what I've told you now, you recognize that climate change is absolutely a public health crisis. So like tobacco, it's time to put a price on carbon. And parallel to the tobacco industry, there is climate change disinformation campaigns all over that are trying to sow doubt on the climate science. But, regardless of one's views on climate change science, we can all support safe routes to schools, physically fit children and adults from cities designed for people, not just cars, clean air from low carbon energy, green jobs and lots of them, preserving natural resources for a healthy future. So in conclusion, confronting the global climate crisis is the greatest human health opportunity of our lifetime. And we can't afford not to confront this, that, this challenge. Thank you very much.